Let's get weird into it. Number 10. The Canary Islands, Godzilla's Grandparents. Imagine you're on vacation. You're sipping a drink on a beautiful volcanic beach. Life is good. Then, something skitters out from behind a rock. It's a lizard. But this isn't your garden variety gecko. This thing is the size of a golden retriever. It's staring at you with unblinking reptilian eyes. And you suddenly realize you are no longer at the top of the food chain. Welcome to the prehistoric Canary Islands, evolution's testing ground for making things unnecessarily large. Before humans showed up with their boats and their insatiable appetite for literally everything, these islands were home to the giant lizard, Galotia goliath. This wasn't just a big lizard. It was a three-foot-long, armor-plated beast that was basically the island's version of a cow. Just, you know, with scales and a terrifyingly blank stare. Alongside it, you had the giant rat, Canariomys bravoi, a two-pound rodent the size of a small cat. On the mainland, a rat that big would be public enemy number one. Here, it was just another Tuesday. This is a classic case of what scientists, in a rare moment of straightforwardness, call island gigantism. When you're stuck on a rock in the middle of the ocean with no major predators, the evolutionary pressure to stay small and nimble just evaporates. It's like living in a gated community with an all-you-can-eat buffet. Why stay small when you can get huge and leisurely? Your body's main job is no longer running for your life. It's just existing, luxuriously. So for thousands of years, these giant lizards and hefty rats just vibed, enjoying their predator-free paradise. Then, the first humans arrived. And what do humans do when they see a unique, isolated ecosystem? They eat it. They ate the lizards. They probably ate the rats. And they brought along their own smaller, more aggressive rats that outcompeted the native giants. It's the ultimate evolutionary tragedy. You spend millennia evolving into the undisputed king of your tiny kingdom. A reptilian monarch lounging in the sun only to get turned into a barbecue skewer by the new, weirdly shaped monkeys who just washed ashore. Number nine, Flores, Land of the Hobbits. You know all those fantasy stories about a lost world of tiny people and miniature elephants? Well, hold on to your hat, because it was real. And it wasn't in Middle Earth. It was on the Indonesian island of Flores. In 2003, scientists digging in a cave found a skeleton that looked human, but it was barely three and a half feet tall. This wasn't a child or a person with a growth disorder. This was an adult, a full-grown member of a new species of human, Homo floresiensis, nicknamed, of course, the Hobbit. And they weren't alone. The island was also home to a species of elephant, the Stegodon. That was no bigger than a cow. This was a complete ecosystem built in miniature. This is the flip side of island gigantism, island dwarfism. When you're on an island with limited resources, not a lot of food, not a lot of space, Getting big is a death sentence. Your body is a gas guzzler in a world with only one gas station, and it's about to run out of fuel. So, evolution hits the shrink ray button. Over generations, the biggest individuals die off, and the smallest ones survive to pass on their tiny genes. It's nature's most effective and most brutal diet plan. So you had these tiny humans hunting tiny elephants with tiny spears. They lived and thrived on Flores for tens of thousands of years, a perfect pocket-sized civilization. They even had to deal with giant, six-foot-long marabou storks, which would have looked like terrifying pterodactyls to someone three feet tall. The most mind-bending part? The last of the hobbits may have died out only 50,000 years ago. Modern humans, your direct ancestors, were already out and about. It means there was a window of time, however brief, where our species shared the planet with another kind of human. A fairy tale that was real, right up until the moment we likely showed up and, as we do, ruined it. Number eight. Cuba, the hummingbird, and the assassin. When you think of evolutionary extremes, you probably think of size or power. But sometimes, the most insane thing evolution can do is push the limits of smallness. Enter the bee hummingbird of Cuba. This isn't just a small bird. It's the smallest bird on the entire planet. It weighs less than a dime. Its nest is the size of a quarter. Its heart beats over a thousand times a minute just to keep its tiny, iridescent body from shutting down. It's a biological miracle, a feathered insect hovering on the edge of what's physically possible. It's so small and so fast, it looks more like a glitch in the matrix than a living creature. This is what happens when an island offers you a very specific job opening, pollinating tiny flowers, and you evolve to be the most ridiculously overqualified candidate for the position. But Cuba isn't just home to the impossibly small. It's also home to the impossibly ancient and weird. Meet the Cuban Selenodon. At first glance, it looks like a shrew with a Pinocchio nose. But this thing is a living fossil, 
a relic from the time of the dinosaurs. And it has a secret weapon that almost no other mammal has. It's venomous. It has a special groove in its teeth that delivers a toxic saliva, like a furry little snake. It's a mammal that never got the memo that mammals aren't supposed to be venomous. It's a walking, sniffling anachronism that survived the asteroid, survived the ice ages, and somehow found itself on a Caribbean island. It's so bizarre and out of place that it represents a whole branch of the mammalian tree that has otherwise vanished from the Earth. The best part? The Selenodon is incredibly high-strung. When it gets stressed out, it's known to shriek, run around in circles, and sometimes just die from the sheer anxiety of it all. An ancient, venomous assassin that can be defeated by a loud noise. Evolution doesn't always make sense. Number 7. Mauritius. The famous doofus. Ah, the dodo. The poster child for extinction. The bird whose name is literally an insult. We think of it as a fat, clumsy, stupid creature that was too dumb to survive. But we've got it all wrong. The dodo wasn't stupid. It was innocent. And its home, the island of Mauritius, was a paradise that failed to prepare it for the real world. For millions of years, Mauritius had no ground predators. None. So, if you were a bird, what was the point of flying? Flying is exhausting. It burns a ton of calories. It's a huge hassle. So the dodo, which was basically a giant souped-up pigeon, just gave up. It became flightless, grew to be three feet tall, and spent its days wandering around the forest floor eating fruit. It had no enemies. It had no fear. It was living the dream. It was a bird that had won the evolutionary lottery and decided to retire in luxury. Then, in the 1500s, sailors landed on Mauritius, and they were hungry. They saw this big, weird, flightless bird and it didn't even run away. It probably waddled right up to them out of sheer curiosity. The dodo had no concept of a predator. It couldn't comprehend that this new, lanky ape thing might want to bash it over the head and cook it. To the sailors, this was the stupidest bird alive. To the dodo, these were the first monsters it had ever seen. Compounding the problem, the sailors brought rats, pigs, and monkeys, which ate the dodo's eggs from their ground-level nests. Within 80 years of our arrival, the dodo was gone. We turned a perfectly adapted, peaceful creature into a symbol for idiocy. We judged an animal for not being paranoid enough to expect our arrival. The dodo wasn't a failure of evolution. It was a failure of humanity. Number 6. New Zealand. The bird apocalypse. Imagine a land with no mammals. No lions, no tigers, no bears. Not even a squirrel. For 80 million years, this was New Zealand. It was an ark adrift in the ocean. And on this ark, the birds took over. They became the rulers, the monsters, and the weirdos. Without mammals to compete with, birds filled every ecological niche. Some became the grazers, like the moa. This wasn't just a big bird. It was a 12-foot-tall, 500-pound feathered giraffe that roamed in herds. And because every monster needs a super monster to hunt it, New Zealand had Host's eagle. This was the largest eagle that ever existed, with a 10-foot wingspan and talons the size of a tiger's claws. It would dive out of the sky and slam into a moa a feathered missile designed to take down giants. Other birds got weird in other ways. The kiwi, instead of evolving to be a better bird, decided to become an honorary mammal. It has heavy, marrow-filled bones, fur-like feathers, and sniffs around on the ground at night like a hedgehog. Then there's the kakapo, a flightless, nocturnal parrot that looks like a grumpy green owl. It's the world's heaviest parrot, and when it gets scared, its main defense is to just freeze. Which, it turns out, is a terrible strategy when the predator is no longer a giant eagle that hunts by sight, but a stoat that hunts by smell. This was a complete, functioning world run by birds. A true bird apocalypse. And then, the Maori people arrived, followed by Europeans. We hunted the moa to extinction. And once the moa were gone, Host's eagle, the most formidable flying predator since the dinosaurs, simply starved to death. It was so hyper-specialized in hunting its giant prey that it couldn't adapt. Its entire kingdom vanished from under its claws, leaving it a king with nothing left to rule. Number 5. The Galapagos. Nature's first draft. You can't talk about weird islands without talking about the Galapagos, the place that famously gave Charles Darwin the biggest light bulb moment in human history. These islands aren't just a place, they're a living laboratory. It's where Mother Nature beta-tested some of her weirdest ideas. Take the marine iguana. It's the only lizard on the planet that forages in the ocean. At some point, a regular land iguana got stranded here, looked at the barren volcanic rock, looked at the ocean full of delicious algae, and thought, you know what? I'm going for a swim. 
Now you have these colonies of black, crusty lizards that look like tiny Godzillas, sunbathing on the rocks, then diving into the cold Pacific water to graze like sea cows. They even have special glands in their noses to sneeze out the excess salt. They are punk rock, and they do not care what you think. Then you have Darwin's finches. They sound boring, but they're the perfect example of evolution getting creative on a budget. A bunch of the same kind of finch arrived on the islands millions of years ago, but each island offered a different menu. Some had big, tough nuts. Some had tiny seeds. Some had insects hiding in bark. So the finches adapted. They became a living toolkit. One species developed a thick, powerful beak for crushing. Another developed a tiny, tweezer-like beak. One even learned to use cactus spines as a tool to poke grubs out of wood. It's adaptive radiation in its purest form. One ancestor. A dozen new solutions. And, of course, there are the giant tortoises these slow, majestic, living boulders that can live for over a century. They are the ancient kings of these islands, moving with a wisdom that only comes from being alive for that long. The Galapagos is evolution in action, a place so strange it forced us to rethink our entire place in the universe. Number 4. Socotra, the alien world. If you ever want to feel like you've been abducted by aliens and dropped onto their home planet, just go to the island of Socotra, off the coast of Yemen. This place is so isolated, so harsh, and so otherworldly that a third of its plant life is found nowhere else on Earth. It is not playing by the normal rules of botany. First, you'll see the dragon's blood tree. It doesn't look like a tree. It looks like a giant inside-out umbrella or a mushroom designed by Dr. Seuss. And if you cut its bark, it bleeds a thick crimson-red sap. For centuries, this stuff was thought to be actual dragon's blood, used in alchemy and magic. Then you'll find the cucumber tree. It's not a vine. It's a tree with a swollen, bulbous trunk that looks like a fleshy, pale bottle with a sad little toupee of leaves on top. It's a botanical abomination, a plant that looks like it's just given up. The entire landscape feels like a surrealist painting. It's the result of being cut off from mainland Africa for millions of years and being subjected to intense heat and drought. The plants here had to come up with completely novel solutions to survive. The dragon's blood tree's weird shape is perfect for capturing moisture from the highland mists. The cucumber tree's fat trunk is a giant water storage tank. It's a testament to the sheer, stubborn creativity of life. When faced with impossible conditions, evolution doesn't just give up. It gets weird. It creates bleeding trees and vegetable-shaped trunks. Socatra is a precious, fragile glimpse into what an alternate reality Earth might have looked like. Number 3. Komodo Island. Land of the Last Dragon. On most islands, the absence of large predators allows herbivores to get huge. On Komodo and its neighboring islands, something different happened. The top predator itself is the giant, the Komodo dragon. This is not just a big lizard. It's a 10-foot, 150-pound monitor lizard that is the apex predator of its entire ecosystem. It's a relic, a holdover from a time when giant reptiles roamed Australia. A small population got stranded on these Indonesian islands and, instead of shrinking, they stayed huge. They are island gigantism with teeth, and their hunting method is the stuff of nightmares. They don't need to be the fastest or the strongest. They just need to land one bite. Their mouths are a filthy cocktail of venom and toxic bacteria. The venom sends you into shock and stops your blood from clotting. The bacteria trigger a massive infection. Once bitten, the dragon's prey, be it a water buffalo or a deer, stumbles off into the jungle, and the dragon just follows, patiently, sometimes for days. It just ambles along behind its dying meal, waiting for the poison to do its work. It is the most terrifyingly lazy hunter on the planet. They will eat anything they can overpower, from goats to humans. They've even been known to dig up shallow graves to consume the recently deceased. It's a primal, horrifying reminder that we are, at the end of the day, just meat. On Komodo, you are not a tourist. You are an item on the menu. Number 2. Australia. The Spiteful Continent. Okay, technically it's a continent. But for 50 million years, it was the world's biggest island. And that isolation baked a certain kind of evolutionary madness into its DNA. Australia is what happens when you leave a landmass alone for too long with a bad attitude. This is the land of marsupials. Nature's first, slightly buggy draft of mammals. Instead of a sophisticated internal placenta, you get a pouch. A biological fanny pack for a half-baked, jellybean-sized baby. You get kangaroos, which are essentially deer that evolved to be professional boxers. You get koalas, which are so specialized to eat toxic eucalyptus leaves that they have almost no energy and spend 20 hours a day sleeping it off. They are the world's cutest drug addicts. And, uh, and then there's the platypus. 
The platypus is not a real animal. It is a biological prank. It's what you get when a committee of drunk gods tries to design a creature. It has the bill of a duck, the tail of a beaver, and the feet of an otter. It lays eggs like a reptile. The males have venomous spurs on their hind legs. And it sweats milk because it doesn't have nipples. It is a walking, swimming, venom-spurring contradiction that breaks every rule in the mammalian handbook. Australia is an entire continent that went down a completely different evolutionary path. It's a beautiful, sun-drenched death trap where everything is either venomous, poisonous, or just shockingly aggressive. It is nature's spiteful masterpiece. Number 1. Madagascar, the island of misfit toys. If you want to see evolution at its most gloriously unhinged, you go to Madagascar. This island is the undisputed champion of weird. It broke off from Africa over 160 million years ago, and then from India 88 million years ago. It's been floating in solitary confinement for so long that 90% of its wildlife is found nowhere else. It's not just an island, it's a parallel universe. This is the kingdom of the lemurs. With no monkeys to compete with, these primitive primates exploded into over 100 different species. There were lemurs the size of gorillas, lemurs that acted like woodpeckers, lemurs that moved like sloths. They filled every role the ecosystem had to offer. The predators are just as strange. The top dog is the fossa, an animal that looks like a puma, a dog, and a mongoose all got thrown into a blender. It's a sleek, muscular killing machine with ankles that can rotate 180 degrees, allowing it to climb down trees head first. But the crown jewel of Malagasy weirdness, the creature that perfectly encapsulates the island's fever dream quality, is the eye-eye. This thing is a primate that decided it wanted to be a woodpecker bat goblin. It has giant sensitive ears like a bat to hear insect larvae chewing under tree bark. It has huge, unsettling eyes that glow in the dark. And it has a long, skeletal, twig-like middle finger that it uses to tap on the wood, locate the grubs, and then fish them out. It is so profoundly strange, so utterly alien, that local legends claim it's a demon. They say that if an eye-eye points its creepy skeleton finger at you, you are marked for death. And honestly, looking into those wide, haunting eyes, you get it. This is what happens when life is left completely to its own devices for millions of years. It doesn't just adapt. It creates nightmares and wonders beyond our wildest imagination. And that's our time for today. More strange things are always coming, so I'll see you in the next one.